Body Mapping, Alexander Technique, and Women in Music with Kristen Wolf Jensen. Stay inspired. Could you share with us about how you got into bike riding? Thank you for asking. So bike riding is just my pandemic hobby. I went years and years without doing it. But um, my main passion exercise-wise through the years has been swimming. I'm a real water freak and just love being in around drinking water. <laughs> um, and uh, But when my neighborhood pool, that's why I moved to this neighborhood, it has a beautiful outdoor pool, um, was closed due to COVID, well, I had to find some other way to be outside and move and bike riding. I had this bike in the garage. So um, it's kind of been a, a, a way to keep some sanity during the, the pandemic to just get on my bike once or twice, sometimes a day, and just ride, get the air on my face and some sunshine and a little cardiovascular uh, exercise. Um, just feels great. Um, get out of the house as well. So I can't say I'm a serious bike rider like Sue Heineman's been, you know, miles and miles around the world. That's not me. I just go around my neighborhood. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's it's a great um, kind of meditation in between lessons. Sometimes I'll just head out for ten minutes, that kind of thing. Um, and I've I think evolved in my own uh, exercise philosophy in the past year that I used to have to find an hour several times a week and now it's like okay I'll take 10 minutes now and maybe 10 minutes later I might do different things throughout the day but that feels great as little uh, refreshers and uh, revitalizing activities. Kristen did you notice with your swimming and and now you know with biking and using like different muscles? Yeah I think Throughout my life, it's it's been a good thing that I have mm -hmm. sought cardiovascular fitness. As a sh short female, my lung capacity is just naturally smaller than taller people and, and, and males. That's just a biological fact. Um, so it's that's been good to, I think, give me some endurance on the bassoon. Um, but muscularly, absolutely as well. Swimming, I think, is a little more of a whole body activity. Integrates the, the whole musculature more than bike riding. Um, but I've, in the past year, made sure I did other things as well. I have mm -hmm. a, a trainer once a week, essentially, who... Great does sort of a combination of Pilates and yoga, and I, I have sought her. She's not only just a great trainer, but she, she as an, uh, you know, having played bassoon lopsided for many decades, she can keep an eye on me for, for keeping symm sym symmetrical, at least, one of my exercise um, things, just to make sure I'm not kind of... Um, reinforcing some not so good patterns stature musculature uh, fascia all those things so um but also strengthening other areas that bike riding might not i think we all get into habits the bassoon is really lopsided and really kind of locks you in more than a lot of instruments you know clarinet they they can move this way they don't have a seat strap locking it in on one level and then Flute has more flexibility. Um, so I have to admit, I have gotten into some not so good habits through the years with, and you know, my right shoulder is permanently <laughs> forward of the left. And so, uh, yeah, figuring out ways to strengthen and balance um, that will counteract those habits. And now that I'm really aware of it and not wanting it to get worse, um, bringing that awareness into my playing as well and shifting some habits and not just relying on what I've always done. Uh, mm. Just going to get worse. I think we all have to always consciously, how am I sitting? Am I really balanced? 
how am I going to pick up this instrument in a way that is as balanced and free and, and feels comfortable, not comfortable in the this is what I've always done way, but truly comfortable in what's um, ergonomically sound and good for me. Could you share about body mapping and what brought you brought you towards that that passion and interest to pursue training sure yeah so body mapping we all humans have literally a map in our brain of how our body is structured and its size and the function of each part and if those maps are at all faulty and all of us have these um, faults in how we perceive um, ourselves, whether we think our spine is smaller than it actually is, or if we think the arm ends right here at this bump on what we call the shoulder, when actually, you know, if you move your arm, you can feel your collarbone moving. Try that right now. It's really cool. So the collarbone, that's part of our arm, and we need to conceive of that if we are going to use our arms efficiently and not get injured while we play the bassoon or daily activities. Um, so body mapping is a, a method of learning more about particularly the skeleton and and how we can use that knowledge to our advantage as musicians to move more efficiently, more fluidly. And I'm finding, um, so it, it, for me, it's been a great way to kind of combine my uh, passions for, for movement and exercise, although body mapping is not necessarily about exercise, but um, with with my passion for playing and, and teaching. So I'm just adding a new dimension to it, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, I'm working on, on um, I'm actually actively training and reading the training manuals and having lessons almost weekly with a licensed body mapping educator, Stephen Kaplan, who teaches oboe at UNLV, is my official mentor in this uh, so that's been really cool to reconnect with him he was my colleague in my first job at UNLV um, great guy and but there's this whole network which because of zoom technology I can meet body mapping teachers all over the country and I've had some really great influence from various people um, so yeah, I mean, the, the idea is that the integrity of any movement, and we as musicians, move. I mean, you can turn the sound off and you still see, right? There's movement. So the integrity of any movement depends on the body map that's governing it. So we need to, to learn. So now I have all these, got my skeleton. That's so cool. <laughs> this dude, but um, so, you know, I still look at it daily and like, wow, look how long the spine really is. It comes way up here into the, you know, in the middle, into the skull, and then <laughs> way down here. It's just fascinating. And that the arms, they, they, did, they just suspend here at the sides of our body. It's just so amazing. And, you know, it's, I think it's helped me to not do that bassoon thing of, put my arm forward, if I just let it be suspended at the, the side. Um, so I'm really excited to keep learning about that and bring it into my bassoon teaching um, and maybe even offer a class in that at UT and maybe other places. Um, it's been really good for my own playing to keep reminding myself of these things. And one thing about body mapping um, which the, the name itself might be misleading, that it's all about learning about the skeleton, but um, it's very much about training inclusive awareness so that as we play, we are aware of our body, but we're also aware our eyes see peripherally, which actually puts the brain in a better place to function um, 
optimally in all kinds of ways. And to not try to block out somebody talking loudly outside the concert hall or um, somebody opening a candy wrapper in the front row and not try to block out the fact that we're nervous, but to bring everything that's happening into our awareness. And in fact, that, that openness, um, that inclusive awareness does help you focus when you need to do on what your body's doing or focus on the conductor. They're, they're all in your awareness all the time and you kind of zoom in, okay, now I'm going to watch the flute player and really enjoy this duet and then zoom out, okay, I'm noticing some nerves in my body, oh, and look, I'm so, um, you know, keeping that full, all-encompassing awareness of how you're using your body, what are you hearing, what are you aiming for musically, and it becomes kind of one gestalt. And so that's been really, really helpful for me as a player, uh, and I want to keep learning about it and um, sharing it. It's really great stuff. And it's, it's so succinct. It sounds complicated, you know, I'm not one to memorize all um, muscles, muscles, names in our body and stuff like that. Um, but it's body mapping is aimed at musicians and just knowing enough to help us do what we need to do. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's very accessible in that way. And, um, even non-scientific minds like like mine can comprehend and, and really apply these things easily to music making. Somebody asked about a book I would recommend, what every musician needs to know about the body, um, by the founder of, of Body Mapping, Barbara Conable. And talk about accessible, it's, it's kind of a picture book with little explanations. It's not like heavy reading, you know, that you really have to concentrate on, <laughs> but um, it's just really um, succinct and and meaningful for what can help us play better. Thick the spine is, how wide it is, and that's there to support us. Um, and you know, like the this part going into the middle of the body is literally in the middle of the body the lower lumbar spine. So we don't have to hold ourselves up. We've got these great spines doing all the work for us. It's a whole system. You change one part of it, it's gonna affect the entire thing. So yes, if your left foot, and one thing I'm experimenting with is um, when I'm standing, this was suggested by my body mapping teacher, maybe my left foot should be a little in front of the right, and maybe that brings that right shoulder back to where it needs to be instead of letting it come forward. So uh, again, it's this kind of full full body effect of one where one part is is going to influence the entire thing. Martin shared is, have you ever worked with an occupational therapist or someone similar about the physicality of playing bassoon? Great question. Thanks, Martin. Um, not a an occupational therapist, although that's a great idea. In, in a way, I think all of our bassoon teachers are occupational therapists, right? <laughs> um, I have that's kind of what I'm doing with the body mapping lessons that I'm taking. Um, is they are not medical uh, doctors, body mapping teachers, but they have developed an eye for what is, is functional movement and, and what is possibly going to cause pain or, or limitation in technique or musicality. So that's been very helpful and, and I would highly recommend finding a, a body mapping educator to, to take some lessons with. Um, and there are, the body mapping sequence is a six hour class and then then you're done just six hours so and there are some online that you can sign up for 
So if, if it really interests you, look into that. Um, I've taken a lot of Alexander Technique lessons. Um, I don't know, Martin, have, have you ever tried any of that? Uh, I've ever done Alexander Technique. My, my mother is an occupational therapist. Oh, okay. Every couple of, every time, I only get to see her a couple times a year, but usually once or twice every, you know, a few years, I sit down with her and I play in front of her. And like her job is to work with elderly people to figure out the most efficient way to use your muscles. And so she'll like, I'll just play in front of her and she'll be like, change your leg like this, you're tensing up. Like, and that's her job is to figure out where, where you're tensing and stuff. Yeah. Amazing. Sounds like she's really helpful. Yeah. It's been really helpful. I, I, I've gotten a few times I've played in front of people and they're like, you, you look weird. But a lot of it is based on the things my mom has told me just to like, it looks peculiar, but it's not as it's there to release tension on how your body naturally wants to sit. Huh. Excellent. Right. And noticing it day to day. So it's not like, okay, my left foot's going to go here forever. And here's how I play. It's, it's a matter of feeling the balance constantly because we are moving um, and finding that fluidity and, freedom. Um, it's not about finding a position, keeping the awareness all times. Matter of balance. Yeah, it's a matter of balance. Hi, Richard. We used to have uh, Elizabeth Waterhouse give uh, Alexander's technique classes here when, when she and Bill would visit. And, uh, right. I, I, most of my students found it very valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great stuff. And uh, so was Bill Waterhouse, was he an Alexander teacher or just married to one? I forget. No, Elizabeth was his wife. Yeah. She taught the uh, Alexander technique for years at the Guild Hall in London. Yeah. It was part of the curriculum. Amazing. I, I firmly believe that some sort of somatic education should be part of every musician's training and, and earlier than college, but it should absolutely be someone on staff should be uh, teaching this because the, the rate of injury is way too high. If we're using our bodies well, there's no reason playing bassoon or violin or anything else should cause injury, but because of mismapping, <laughs> uh, there's too much pain, too much injury in our field. So ideally, body mapping, Alexander technique, all these things will become more common in, in how we teach young kids that, that it is about how you move um, and then make it part of the conservatory slash university training as well. So Kristen, I'd love to dive in about uh, Meg Quickly. Yeah, great. Well, Nicolasa Custer and I were in Argentina at the IDRS conference in the year 2000. And um, I think we had gone to the finals of the Jelly Fox competition and watched all these uh, white men compete against each other. <laughs> we thought, why aren't we up there? Why not? Why, why aren't there women up there? Um, our, our focus at that point was not people of color, but we're asking those questions now for sure. Um, and we didn't have all the answers, but thought and knew it was a complex reason of socialization and opportunity and confidence building. So we wanted to do something about that and create an opportunity for young women to develop the confidence and the skills and the competitive spirit and, and and have something big to strive for. So we did. We went for it. It took several years to, to find the money and form the organization. And so we launched our first competition in 2005 and had only five finalists at that point. And um, it, it grew from there, I think. And you were there as a finalist in 2007. And then we moved it to 10 in 2010. Wow. And that's when we also grew it and 
through the whole organization and start a, a symposium surrounding Amazing. the competition. Um, and did we ever get kicked back that it, we didn't include men? Yes. And our answer to that was, well, there's been a void. Men have been successful in competitions like this in a way, although they didn't ex specifically say these competitions are excluding women, they weren't exactly inclusive either. And, you know, again, it's so complex, but all the composers of the required pieces were always white men. Um, many of even, you know, our generation of, of bassoonists are, were trained by men. So those are the role models. How do we create role models? Mm -hmm. So young women want to stay involved in music, want to pursue this passion and not um, feel discouraged or like they don't belong here. We started out uh, with the intent to commission for every mm -hmm. competition. So in 2005, we did commission Hai Kang Lee, okay. who wrote Dreaming in Colors for us. And it's since been recorded by Ben Cuello and probably others. And it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. Mm -hmm. um, I think we, we've had some other commissions throughout the years, but Sometimes we didn't, you know, we all, those of us running it have other full-time jobs, so we, sometimes we didn't get on it soon enough to commission a piece by mm -hmm. the time we had to announce the repertoire, or we didn't have the funding to do it a certain year. But we have found, I think Nancy Galbraith had already written this great piece, mm -hmm. so we're like, all right, let's yep. use that. It deserves to be um, purchased yes. by lots of bassoonists and, and known played and performed and enjoyed by audiences. Um, Margie Grieveling Hay, uh, piece, did we do that one of your years, Julie? Um, no? the, I think it was, it was, uh, the first year was Nancy Galbraith in 2007. And I am remembering Libby, Libby Larson in 2010. Yeah. So I think those two pieces were already in existence. We did not commission them, but 2012 must've been, Margie Green, Blaine Hague. We Great. commissioned her with the help of Barry Stees. He, he Great. some funding for that, which was fabulous. Um, yeah, and then, then we partnered with the Bassoon Chamber Music Competition, Composition Competition, Great. to have a call for scores. And that's the year that Jenny Brandon's uh, Colored Stones won wow. that competition. So we used that as our wow. uh, competition piece. Um, yeah, and then fast forward to this year, and um, I was back on the competition committee thinking about what our pieces would be, and I thought, well, it's been great that we've featured one woman each time, but why can't we do more? <laughs> so this year, we had um, Anne Gabor, Richard Meek, um, I think, did you commission Anne to write um, Ghost Anne, Dance? Anne has written several pieces for our trio and, and myself. Uh, I can't remember the one you played. There's another one I had her write, not the one you played the, a year ago. Yeah, um, so Ghost Dance is the one I um, recorded, the one. and that was a competition piece this year. Um, great piece. Thank you for uh, your work with Anne Gabor and Richard. Um, and we had, what else did we have? Um, well, Adolphus Hale Stork, a great African-American composer was on there. And Jose Siqueira, great Brazilian composer. Um, and in the finals, Natalie Mahler, uh, her translations was one of the pieces. So um, yeah, we were really excited to kind of elevate all of these great pieces. Was Meg Quigley always international? From the beginning, it was intended for women of the Americas, meaning mm -hmm. the American continents. Um, Nicolasa Custer, my co-founder, uh, grew up in Panama. So she had a particular um, interest in developing the uh, skills and visibility of the 
bassoon community in, in Latin America. Um, and that's still an area that we are hoping to enhance even more, um, both with the guest artists who, who come to the symposium, but also really facilitating getting the music to the potential competitors down there and um, helping them learn it and compete at a, a high level. We've had several um, winners from Latin America, which is very impressive, but um, relatively uh, lower proportion of people entering from there. So we're hoping to pump that up. Martin has asked, have you ever thought of allowing for outside suggestions for new rep by female composers? Absolutely. Do you have some recommendations? I, I do. I have a, a piece by a composer I'm working with that's in Shanghai right now. And she uh, wrote a piece called In Malaysia about her childhood for bassoon and piano. And it's I've been kind of obsessed with it for about a year because it's just this beautiful, lush piece of music that she wrote. And she public, got published by Imagine, and then she moved back to Shanghai after she was in the States for a while. So I don't think it's gotten any traction, but. Okay, tell me, I'm writing it down, Martin. There was a submitted question from Joey Kleesner, um, and he has asked, what has been your most engaging bassoon-related pastime the past 12 months? One is I have been so fortunate to be able to go play live music in Houston in the River Oaks Chamber Orchestra, where I'm a member. Um, they had very strict protocols of testing everyone beforehand and distancing and learning the ventilation of, of the venue. So our September uh, concert we did in basically an outdoor um, pavilion kind of thing. The breeze is blowing, it was lovely. Um, and then smaller groups in our usual venue. So that's been amazing. Um, you know, never again will I or anyone in that group, and I'm sure musicians worldwide, take for granted the privilege and the um, amazing uh, camaraderie that comes with collaborating musically. Um, so that was fabulous. And just two days ago, I had my oboe colleague over and we played in my backyard. Um, that was really fun. Since the weather's nice, uh, we are planning to keep working on Jenny Brandon's Going to the Sun for Oboe and Bassoon. And uh, so that was our first reading, rehearsal of it. Um, so kind of these pick up outdoor, let's just play. I did that with the UT Bassoon Ensemble in October. Um, they came and played in the cul-de-sac on which I live and we went to a park and played for um, people in the park. Um, and I'm having, a, we're doing this again in a couple weeks because the weather will be nice again. Um, just a chance to, to be together, have fun, keep our distance lower aerosols in the outdoor you know, um, atmosphere, but hopefully uh, get to a park and share our music making with, with other people. So it's been fun to be resourceful and, and still find ways to collaborate and, and get together with fellow musicians and create something beautiful. So I'm still looking forward to getting my interview with Kristen. Seems every time we meet, we get we part without getting that done. I know. It's been decades now. <laughs> um, a couple times I remember to find an opportunity to, for us two old and oldies to play together, but it never seems to have happened. Right. Well, we'll make it happen. we got to do this. And we're in the same state, right? Granted, it's an eight-hour drive from <laughs> Austin to Lubbock, but... <laughs> Lee Munoz has always asked a really good question about like a class in school or like a course that students should have the opportunity to take. Lots of lots of things. Hopefully music schools in general are evolving to train 
the 21st century musician, which is so multifaceted that, yeah, you got to know how to set up a mic in your own room and, and capture the best acoustic. Um, and, and it doesn't take, you know, a three credit hour acoustics course to get some basic um, knowledge and skill in, in how to do that and how to discern what's a good acoustic um, recording. Um, so I think a lot of us applied teachers are trying to incorporate some of that. Um, some of my students are actually taking an acoustics course right now, which does go into more of that and how to record multi-tracks of, of your own playing and, and edit those. It's a great skill, especially right now during the pandemic. Um, but I, I would come back to saying essential would be some sort of movement class, body mapping and or Alexander technique. Feldenkrais is great. Um, you know, if, and or, and I don't have a you know, definitive answer for this, but some sort of um, way of tying music to humanities and being human. So whether that's an art history class or having our music history teachers and theory teachers think a little more globally about um, what it means to be a musician in, in the history of the world and, and to experience uh, the amazing emotions and expression that um, players experience and that listeners can experience. Um, so it's, it's not just an academic study, but always tied to um, those human qualities. What's great about music? I'm sure my sister Carol would want me to send you greetings had she known we were on Zoom this evening. Absolutely. But could I tell her whether voice lessons plays any role in uh, learning to play successfully the bassoon? Absolutely. Um, thank you for reminding me of that, Richard. Uh, so I studied voice when I was 15 with Richard Meek's sister. <laughs> in Connecticut, small world, no. right? <laughs> um, and I love singing so much, loved, loved it back then, and, you know, couldn't decide which career path to take, singing or bassoon, and I, you can tell her, Richard, I, re I actually regret um, not keeping up with voice. I don't think it had to be one or the other, um, and, you know, Having not used my voice since high school, I <laughs> um, learned. Did you find any of the vocal instruction ap applicable in your own teaching? Absolutely. Um, I refer to imitating singers all the time because I do still believe and feel that um, you know the human voice is as innate a, a music making process as we humans can um, experience. So we want to, as you were saying, Julie, we have this kind of external bassoon thing. Um, we try to make, make it part of our being and our, and our body, but the voice really is. It's right there. So um, musically, there's lots to learn from studying voice and certainly just also technically of, of Breathing is such a central part of, of the study, and um, and you know, diction translates to um, articulation on the bassoon, and um, trying to be clear and imaginative and and musical with that. Uh, so, yes, please tell Carol Ann, your sister Richard, that I uh, cherish that year, maybe year plus, that we had together and that all kinds of things, like valuable musically and pedagogically that I took from them and am sharing with my students. I'm sure she'd be tickled to hear that. Give her my warmest regards, please.
and her daughter, who I sang in choir with. Kristen, thank you so much for your time today. 